A Perfect Spy by John le Carré. Dramatized for radio by Robert Forrest. Episode 2. The green cabinet stands in my room now like, well... I could imagine a primitive believer approaching it with dreadful awe. Has it been sent here from heaven? Does it contain the gospel according to Rick? Where was I? Yes. Peggy Wentworth. About to break the cabinet open with a chisel, while I was there to do the job more subtly with a pair of dividers. Magnus Pym, junior but bona fide licensed spy. Your father, she says. That brute of a man killed my husband, and I'll have the proof of it and bring the bastard down. Jack, I'm sorry, but I can't remember now which bits she told me when and where. Some failing of my professional memory. I think the first of it came out on the top deck of an otherwise empty bus. Why we got on a bus and where we were going, I have no idea. But we were definitely on a bus. John... My darling John, he fell into the thresher and lost both legs below the knee. Insurance money? Of course. My John was a fool as well as a darling, but I'd seen to his cover. Four thousand pounds we got. And who after me is his first visitor in the hospital? With the flowers and the chocolates and the bubbly? My father. Your father, the bastard Rick Pym, with his champagne and his silver tongue. He'd see us right if it killed him. There would be 12.5% plus profits year in, year out. More than enough for a decent living and some put by for our boys' schooling. He'd study law like his own boy. First-rate boys, the pair of them. Well, that's you, Magnus. A first-rate boy like my Alistair. Upright lawyers, the both of you. I'll never be a lawyer. And I hope you won't be a liar either like your father is. There's me, up at four in the morning for the milking and falling asleep at midnight over the accounts. And where's your daddy? Playing the saint, the bedside of that aged darling John of mine, who signed away every one of those four thousand pounds. Signed away every penny. Eggs and chips and beans. I'm sure that's what I bought for her at some cafe somewhere. I've no idea where. I don't know what time of night it was. But I'm sure it was eggs and chips and beans. So, there's John, coughing out his last few breaths. And who's at his bedside again? Rick Pym. Daddy. He has a problem. A temporary problem. Liquidity. The very thing. No 12.5% available. No profits. Original capital. All tied up. (laughs) But Daddy will see us through this. Just as soon as John signs these papers... Papers to mortgage the farm, the land and the beasts, and near as damn it his wife and son as well. Here's a saint and his lawyer to manage it all for the best. Hm. I'll tell you something else about that saintly dad of yours. He can easily fall for a lovely Irish smile on a woman. Where on earth were we after that? The air was frosty, and it smelled of the sea and cow dung and petrol and fish. We were walking on cobbles. There were cranes that rose up like gallows. Peggy was still talking. And the rest is a kind of confession. Forgive me, son of Pym, for I have sinned. There's no need for confession, Mrs Wentworth. Peggy, and there is a need. The confession of a lonely woman. Fool of a husband dead in the ground. A sickly boy to look after. A bankrupt farm. And the man who possesses you anyway beckons you up first class to London. Please, Peggy, I I don't need to hear any more. So off I go. Leave the accounts and the milk in both. Even leave the bloody dishes unwashed. And there I am, with my lovely Irish smile, being bought fine clothes in Bond Street, fancy petticoats and silks. John's in his grave and I'm in bed with the devil. Please, no more. Did you know your father had been Lady Mountbatten's lover? He never was. Did you know they wanted him for ambassador to Paris? Did you know he's wicked enough to con his way into heaven? And now he might be an MP? Real power, Magnus. Can he win? Can he?
Can he win, Magnus? Well, when all this started, you could have had 50 to 1. Within a week, he was down to 25s. The Labour boy's a jock, red beard, looks like a mouse peeping out of a bear's backside. Tory, thank the Lord's a landed pucker. Toils a day a week in the city, rides his hounds, wife opens fates with her teeth. Your old man's nine to two and shrinking. I'll wager you a tenner this minute that come polling day he'll be evens. So, Jack, no doubt you can see what my next mission must be. Down to the cellar again, with the dividers your minions have taught me to use. And, Jack, your minions have taught me well. My fingers are light and quick and agile. This is what I was born for, to be God's detective. And the lock trips like a hair-trigger trap. First draw, Watermaster Dorothy, marital, very thin file. Bankruptcy, an entire draw crammed full. Now, here it is. Rex versus Pym, 1940. The judges summing up, verdict, sentence, disposal of prisoner. No camera back then, Jack, so I read for an hour, following my vocation. Divine service in progress. Then it's up to my bedroom and write it all down. Operational memory in fine working order back then. Last words. Dear Peggy, I hope that the enclosed will be of use to you. Uh, People say to me... People say to me... Rick... What is liberalism? And I tell them, it's about ideals. Ours is a party of ideals. Ah, you can guess what they say to that, hmm? All very well, Rick, but you can't eat ideals. They won't buy you a nice bit of lamb chop. They won't even buy you a bag of chips. And here's my answer to that good people of Gulworth North. Ideals are like the stars. Maybe we can't reach them, but they lead us on. They lead us to higher things. I have a question. The question's after the show. No, that's all this is, a show. Tell me, Mr. Ideals, have you ever been in prison? She's an Irish maddie. Back to the box with her. No, no, let her ask. Have you ever been in prison? Did you serve a sentence for embezzlement, for swindle, for fraud? He turns away from her for a moment or two. It's not an abrupt move, no sign of shock. He turns slowly. He is nodding his head. He seems calm, rueful perhaps. But his eyes fix on mine. And there is the flick knife gleam. Ladies and gentlemen, my old friend Peggy Wentworth is right. You're no friend of mine, Ricky Pym. I'm sorry to hear you say that, Peggy, because you're wrong. But you are right about this. When I was a young man, eager, eager above all to see my family right, but too eager by far, I strayed across the border of what was justified, what was lawful. Justice extracted her penalty. I paid in full measure. I'll pay for it in my conscience. All my life. But consider this. Look at the young men in this hall tonight. Children, grandchildren, even my own son Magnus here on the stage with me. If one of these young people ever makes a mistake and pays the price, pays it in full as I have and comes to you. Dad, Mom, it's me. It's your son. Who among us is going to slam the door in his face? Your candidate is a straight-dealing liberal, and your candidate is a repentant Christian. Yes, well said. And away he soared on angels' wings. Tom, your grandfather was magnificent that night. I watched and listened with a smile on my face and tears in my eyes. Signs of devotion and love. And mock if you will, Jack, but I did love him, and my devotion was real. So too, of course, was my terror, because I was sure he knew I was the traitor. The bastard knew. These lanes are still slippery underfoot. Under tyre, you mean? Bentley tyres? Yes. And the lanes are... 
Um, what, uh, crooked? And I'm driving too fast. Well, it's certainly fast. And I'm drinking. See that wooden gate up ahead? Hold on. We're going to destroy it. You all right? We're in a field. Are you all right? I think so. Are you? Get out. Then what? Go for help. We don't need help. Get out of the car. Climb onto the roof. <laughs> Underneath the moonlight, up above the snow. Are you not cold? Look at the stars, shining up there like ideals to aim for. You love your old man? Yes. You were crackerjack tonight. Best ever. I told them the truth, and God heard it. He always does. So don't ever lie to me again. I know, Magnus. I know what you've done. I know what you haven't done. You haven't been at Oxford studying law. Mm. You've been doing, what is it? Well, language, literature, airy-fairy stuff. Dad, they're great things. They could take me anywhere. Promise me this. Anything. Don't smoke till you're 21. If you make it, there's 5,000 pounds waiting for you, cash in hand. I never did take up smoking, and I never did see that £5,000. Do I still believe he knew I'd betrayed him? Do I strongly suspect he suspected I had? And yet he said nothing. Why? Because God was listening. God always hears, and he saw God's justice in it. My passing secrets to the enemy Wentworth was years after Grimble's ghastly school and the ghastly death of Lipsy. Still at school, 16 years old, I was summoned to meet... Oh, but Tom, I can do better than that for you, surely. Because this is a boy's own adventure story. A tale of treasure and intrigue and an astonishing femme fatale. Pim thuds the great brass door knocker against its stud. Rain is lashing in the lamp-lit London street. The door opens no more than an inch. There's an eye there. Then he's rushed, tight fingers in his armpit, into a room lit only by those same street lamps. Pim's father introduces a tall, willowy lady with a feather in her hat, Elena Weber, a baroness. We have house of marble, darling. We have mirrors in gold framing. We have culture. We lose everything, but not everything entire. Both the Nazis and the Bolsheviks have stolen most of her family's fortune, but there is a box hidden somewhere in Bern, Switzerland, and in that box is treasure. It's worth a bomb, Magnus, says Pim's father. It's Hiroshima, son. And schoolboy Pim, with his gift for languages, must accompany the astonishing Baroness across his first dangerous frontier and find that treasure. Pim has been given an envelope containing many ten-pound notes, and the Baroness has been given many more. Father's investment and Pim's operational expenses. The woman and the boy reach Burn. At her hotel bedroom door, she kisses him on the mouth. Her mouth opens. The bedroom door closes. He never sees her again. Pim is alone in a foreign country, but at least it's Switzerland, the spiritual home of natural spies. He works as a night waiter. He sleeps in a Salvation Army hostel. He enrolls at university, lies about his age and his qualifications, and hands over the last of his ten-pound notes. All worth it, because now he has papers. His only fear now is that his father will come looking for his vanished baroness, his missing money, his undercover son. I see I've arranged the items on my desk as if setting a trap for a searcher. Staple at a handle of teacup, a corner of my precious copy of Simplicissimus aligned with a pencil point, and the embassy burn box an exact inch from the waste paper basket. I'm sorry, Tom. Your father is weary. His tale of adventure in Bern must be to be continued. Where are you, Magnus, my best boy? You've been my best boy for going on 35 years. 
since we first spoke in the porch of that English church in Bern. What did I see in you? Short back and sides, spoke the king's English, but with a good smattering of foreign, decent public school, a games player, understood discipline, just the type the firm liked. And so did I. And now, according to Mary, you think I should have been ditched years ago. Too many miles in the saddle. No room now for old wartime heroes. I'm going nowhere, Magnus. Not before I've found you. The truth will out, best boy. He's gone to ground, Jack. We can't deny that. But we've no reason so far to think his loyalty is anything other than impeccable. This could all be a personal matter. Uh, an emotional thing. Of course it could. His father just died. Can, can shake a man badly. Why did he take the embassy burn box? Well, if the man's in the throes of some kind of breakdown, uh, then... What's in the burn box? Uh, papers. And have you considered the possibility he took them to keep them safe? Name this kid. All his jewels. Everyone in Czechoslovakia, other places too. Is he keeping his jaws safe, Nigel? When do you pull the boat? When the fifth floor waves the flag. And there's no sign yet of their doing so. They insist the most important thing is to act natural, look busy. Mm, total normality in all areas. Mm. And if we evacuate his agents, Jack, what's that going to tell the Americans? We'll be meeting the Americans in a day or two. Harry Wexler's coming over. Wexler? The right hand of God at Langley. And Grant Leder is coming in from Vienna. Dear God, Magnus is devious, John. It's a meeting about Magnus. They know nothing, of course, about his latest puzzling adventure. Be sure we keep it that way. Jack. Jack, wait. Total insanity in all areas. Normality as usual. I have things to tell you. Things? About Magnus? But Nigel's not to know. As I said, personal. Emotional. Right. We can walk in the park. No. We go to your flat. A safe house. We make love, and then I give you secrets. And be sure you love me properly. <laughs> I'll make it worth your while. What did I see when I first shook your hand, Jack? A straight-backed British warrior. Rock jaw and blue eyes. The ten years between us, in terms of war and peace, were a generation. You wore your airborne tie, silver-winged horse and crowned Britannias on a maroon field. You said you were assistant passport officer at the embassy, but I knew even then that's not all you were. That's not what you really were. You'd parachuted behind enemy lines. You had killed our enemies. I had betrayed a friend by carving his initials in a lavatory. But we were both spies, and we're both growing old. You first. So, is that proper enough for you? Satisfactory. <laughs> What's in the burn box? You're the one with secrets to tell. Nigel and you. Have a look about you when that box is mentioned. Uh, not in front of the children, look. Names, Kate. Names and code names. That's serious stuff. That could get a lot of children burned. No. Come on. Many years ago, I did a favour for Magnus. How many years ago? Many. We were having an affair at the time. Oh, did you know that? News to me, but hardly a surprise. Actually, that's the wrong word. Magnus doesn't have affairs. He has different lives. What was the favour? Uh, an entry in his personnel file. He wanted it removed. It was from way back, his National Service days. An army report on some Joe he'd been running. Czechoslovakian. He said if certain people picked through the file, he'd never make it to the fifth floor. Who was the job? Oh, no, he wasn't the problem. There was a girl involved with the operation and then with Magnus. Or, or the other way around. Well, he'd been well out of line with her and wanted anything about her out of his record. Name? Sabina. 
She was Czech too. Sabrina, very pretty. Uh, by the way, what about <laughs> Poppy? You ever hear of a woman called Poppy? No. What did you do about the file? I stole it. Give it to Magnus? No. No, I kept it. I thought I'd put it back someday, but I never did. I told him I still had it when he phoned me on Monday night. I didn't know you smoked, Kate. I don't. Drinking well, too. He was in a call box. I counted four 50 pence pieces. He was on for about 20 minutes, so middle distance. What did he have to say for himself? Well, a lot of it I couldn't make out. He was crying. He needed to hear my voice. He was sorry for everything. He wasn't a bad man. And I could tell anyone I liked about the file because he was free now and it didn't matter anymore. I asked him where he was. He said, I've run out of change. Last words. Out of change. Where are you going? Bathroom. Keep your fingers away from my razor blades. Oh, for God's sake, Jack, not that again. He's close. And I'm going to find him. Did somebody do that to you once? Find me? No. Kill herself. Or himself. Let's just say once would be too often. I wonder how many other women we've shared, Magnus. There was Mary, of course. But I was tired of her anyway, and she was just the right wife for you. Top-notch English rose from just the right family. All church and army and spy establishment. She would have made excellent cover for a double. Is that all she really was? Well, whatever other kind of shit you are, you should be proud of your son. I'm proud to be his godfather. Where are we going, Uncle Jack? It's like wilderness up here. Sugarloaf Hill. You made that up. I did no such thing. And to prove it, we're here. Now, you see that pylon up there? If we shoot that down, we let the bloody Russians in. So, what do we do? We pitch the launcher next to the pylon and shoot away from it. Clay pigeons. The <laughs> very thing. All the gears in the boot, including your own 20 bore. But how do we get in? Look at the gate, the wire. Ministry of Defence, entry forbidden. We march straight up there and we yell, Open Sesame! Or we could use these keys. Oh, amazing, Uncle Jack. Amazing yourself. <laughs> Let's go. Let... Ah, damn, another miss. Still 11.9 to you. All right. One more from you. Let... 11.10 to me. But let me tell you, boy, you're getting a lot harder to beat. <laughs> I know I am. But you're still lost. So you pick up the cartridges. I fancy a bit of report writing while you're at it. All right. There's Buzz. What about it? No questions. Response. Uh, holiday in the summer, me and Dad and Mum. Notable event. Response, boy. Um, Dad got drunk, slid out all night. Just one night. Not that. Another response. Uh, cricket match. Oh. Oh, right. The, the old man. He held him to Dad's arm and they walked around. Height? Uh, six foot. A bit under, maybe. Colour of hair? Hard to be sure. He wore a straw hat. Colour of beard, then? Well, no beard. Shaggy moustache. Grey. Build? Uh, thin, snoopy and a limp. Old man, you say? Age? Oh, ancient. What's that mean? Am I ancient? He was a lot older than you. Or well, maybe not. Clarify. Well, the limp, the stoop. He was holding on to Dad, and he was thin. And his face was, um... Describe? Well, really thin. Thinner than the rest of him. And he looked... He looked how? Like he'd been through a lot. Maybe ill. In pain, or an accident, or suffered. So, he might not have been all that ancient, really. Not a bad report. 
No, Digby Hotel, peppered steak. Medium rare for me, well done as leather for you, and all the trimmings for the pair of us. Including chips? Of course, including bloody chips. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. So, um, Dad's all right, is he? Of course he is. Well, he kept talking about freedom. Nobody could give it to us. We've got to grab it for ourselves. Truth in that. And he seemed to be saying that if I was unhappy, I should run away. And he said the same things in his letter, on and on about freedom. It was weird, actually. The steak is as good as ever. Mm, mine's super. Yes, they do a good boot sole here. Mm -hmm. What letter was that? If he came to see you. Mm, he did. Two days later, the letter came. I thought he was going back to Vienna, Monday latest. But the letter was posted on Tuesday. Could have been Monday, after a final post. Means he was still here Monday night. Postmark Reading. I know what you did, Magnus. At Heathrow, you put up a smokescreen about a flight to Edinburgh. Then you hopped on a coach to Reading. You are police? Detective. Marvel. Yeah. So, fair hair, maybe a wee bit too long, polite spoken, carrying a large black briefcase. He asked you for change. How much? I can offer nothing on the briefcase. I saw him only from the west up. He was wearing a black tie. That's the man. I gave him five pounds and fifty pences. That was his request, and as I had an abundance of them, I obliged. He gave me a ten pound note. The price of his second-class single to London was four pounds and thirty pence. I gave him his ticket, ten fifties, and the balance in smaller denominations. Is my recollection of sufficient exactitude? It is superb. May I tell you something about that well-spoken man? Nothing too bloody, please. If that man spoke to you in your accent, you wouldn't know if it was him or you speaking. Ah, a master of disguise. Well, Magnus, you didn't go to London because that's where you bought a ticket to. You phoned Kate from Reading. But she counted four fifty-pence pieces. You had at least ten. So who else did you phone? You posted your letter to Tom from Reading. And then where? Am I going to read in the paper soon that a senior officer of the British Secret Service has popped up all smiles in Moscow? I've read that one before. Tom, I know I promised you more of your teenage father's adventures in Bern, but you may be disappointed by the next episode. There is no skullduggery or violence. It is, in fact, an episode of calm and domesticity. It begins with young Pim sitting in the third-class railway buffet, slowly sipping his one glass of beer and looking like a forlorn and undiscovered poetic genius. A middle-aged man with a doughy face and unruly grey hair, wearing a buttoned-up raincoat and with a yellow chow dog on a lead, approaches Pim's table and bows. We are not disturbing you. The chair is available. This is Herr Ollinger. Herr Ollinger manages some kind of factory and he's married to an angel and has three angelic daughters. Within an hour, he is offering Pim a room in his home for as long as Pim wishes to do him the honour. Frau Ollinger is indeed an angel. Through her kitchen troops an ever-changing and seemingly endless army of migrants and misfits and orphans and fugitives. Tom... For once your father's life is almost complete. He has a family, he is fed and watered, he has a bed. The only thing missing is a friend. It is forbidden for foreigners to hang their washing in Swiss basements. <laughs> I'm sure that can't be true. How can you be sure when it is forbidden in Switzerland even to be foreign? To be foreign and poor is a hanging offence. You are the English inmate here. Uh, my name is Pym. Lord Pym? Magnus Pym. But of aristocratic stock? Well, not, not really. Nothing very special. I will call you Sir Magnus. You may call me Axel. Are you German? 
I am from a town that no longer exists. Once it was Austrian, and then it was German, and then it was Czechoslovakian. Since it no longer exists, it is none of these things. <laughs> <laughs> and since it, it, it no longer exists, I can never go home. Where is home for you? England? Uh, well, uh, hard to say, really. My family moved around so much. Name a favourite place. Ooh. Farley Abbott? No. Actually, I was only there for one day, but it was perfect. The day, I mean. I was there with my father. Ah. We rode bicycles on the beach and played cricket. And... Oh, sorry, you, you really don't No, know. I, I do want this father of yours, Admiral Pym. Is he still at sea, or was it the father who went missing in Egypt after El Alamein? <laughs> While you were afraid, but defiant in the London Blitz. <clears throat> but then, you were in Coventry, too. No? You saw the cathedral go up. You have been telling your war stories to Frau Ollinger and also to one of her daughters. They have not been consistent, Sir Magnus. That is my first lesson to you. You must be <coughs> consistent in your lies. Not really lies. Embellishment. I understand. Maybe that is disquieting, eh? My understanding you, the stories you told were a kind of giving. You told lies out of the goodness of your heart. My first lesson, are you a teacher? Maybe we educate each other. Herr Ollinger found me in his factory, sleeping on sacks <laughs> in his storeroom. I was foreign and had no papers and I was smelly. But he brought me to his home. What does that teach you? Herr Ollinger is a good man. Yes, he is. But the main lesson is, I am foreign and I have no papers. So if you accept my invitation to knock on my door and share a drink and a talk with me, what danger might you be in? I accept your invitation. No surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I know how fascinating I am. <laughs> good. We will talk nonsense and save the world a little. What did I start you off with, Magnus, all those years ago? We knew your German was coming along, so we gave you some translation work. Technical stuff. From funny little firms who were making things we didn't much like. Nasty things. It was junk, and I half knew it at the time. You didn't want my translations, Jack. You wanted me. Then we learned about the Cosmo. The Cosmo was a sort of political debating club at the university. I became a member to spy on girls. We'd heard some of the Cosmo mob were a tad outspoken. A few names would help. No high-minded scruples about the sanctity of academia? And your answer was perfection. Not if it was for my country. So how might you go about getting us the names? Your response was so fast, it almost took my breath away. I could suggest we start a Cosmo newsletter. I'd need a list of members for that. And I thought this young bastard is good. This one could be my best boy. I tell you, Jack, we reap what we sow, even if the harvest is thirty-odd years in the growing. What is this? A bottle of whiskey. I'm a vodka man. I drink only vodka. Ah, I have no vodka. Then I will drink your whiskey. So, how can you afford Scotch whiskey? A student? <laughs> a part-time waiter? I do a little work for the embassy as well. That stuff's dirt cheap for them, duty-free. British embassy. You work for the British doing what? what? Translation, research, clerical stuff, really. I met one of their chaps at the English church. Seems to have taken a shine to me. So, this is the famous typewriter. Oh, ancient by the look of it, but it's got stamina. I hear it tapping well into the night. Yeah. Thanks. Cheers. <coughs> <coughs> you even cough like an English schoolboy. <laughs> Wait till I have a relapse, then you will hear adult European coughing. <laughs> uh, speaking of schoolboys, you, you said we're to educate each other. Yes. 
You will bring books for me. I, without papers, cannot go to the library. Erasmus, Descartes, Hume, Kant, Hegel, Nietzsche. And I suppose we should also have a glance at Marx and Engels. Then the painters, abstractionists, decadents, Jews, anyone forbidden. Just ask the librarian for names the Nazis didn't like. <laughs> what is it you're writing? A monumental work of philosophy. Mystery and poetics. It'll take years. And me? What about you? These are the books you want. And my education? <laughs> <laughs> I am your education. I will provide much of the material for the great autobiographical novel I have no doubt you will write. That, too, will take years. Her, her name was Lipsy. I think she may have been the best person I ever knew. When she died, it was like the whole world went dark. Adolescent rebel piss. You want the world gone dark? Try the Russian front. I got a medal for that. <laughs> we called it the Order of the Frozen Meat. <laughs> Normandy saw your father, the Admiral, coming at me, shot me in spine and hip. Try having a mother ill with jaundice. And try wheeling her all the way to Dresden. The dog of the Olingers, it scratches at my door. Because it's fascinated by you. Here. Water. The radiator, either freezing or boiling. A little more? Magnus, dribbling, canting nightingale. Smell of blackboard, dust and masturbation. Me, smell of prison and hospital and the Russian prison and the American prison and hospital and German prison and then every damned one they beat you up, prison and hospital. For a bit more torture they shot on one of your legs. <laughs> Darkness? You don't even have a limp. I've got another bottle of whiskey. I think you'll be well enough for it soon. Uh, I fought against the British, Magnus. Maybe I was the one who killed your father. No, no, you didn't. He survived the war. I didn't fight for the Nazis. I fought <coughs> for my homeland. Then I just fought to stay alive. I understand that. No, I don't have one. A homeland. Do you, Sir Magnus? Maybe. A little bit of England. Far away something. Farley Abbott. Huh. Put down the book, which is anyway trash. It is Goethe's birthday, and we must go out into the air. You're well enough? You're not ill if you can stand up. You will have to adjust your speed and act as my second walking stick. I accept your invitation. Springtime and birdsong. A Swiss park in the spring. Neutral heaven. <laughs> they have the arm of a brave English aristocrat. I love all <laughs> English aristocrats. But you, Sir Magnus, you I love the best. You're definitely ready for that second bottle of whiskey. Ah. Shall we sit down? And I uh, have a present for you. Ah. Not with me. I left it in my room in case I was arrested out here in the tweeting paradise. You'll find it under my pillow if you have to go back alone. That will not happen. You will not be astonished to hear that it's a book. A 17th century German novel by a man named Grimmelshausen. Super name. His book teaches us that the world is a mad place and is getting madder every day. He looked after me when I was ill. Even when I was abusing you. I don't remember abusing you, but I'm sure I must have. <laughs> and you stayed with me. 
No doubt a lot of what I said was nonsense, but this is true. Russians, Germans, Americans, they would all like to get their hands on me, partly because sometimes I have no papers and sometimes I have the wrong papers, but mainly because I have escaped from all their prisons. And walk out of their hospitals. You said something about pushing your mother all the way to Dresden in a wheelchair. <laughs> Who could afford a wheelchair? It was a handcart. You stayed with me. Why did you do that? It was the thing to do. Feeble answer, you stayed not out of duty or because I'm fascinating. It's because, Sir Magnus, on that first day in the basement, we began a friendship. Yes. We are friends, Sir Magnus. Yes. Yes. Uh, but there is a danger here. You let me use you as a walking stick. The danger is I may use you like this for the rest of our lives. <clears throat> this is excellent work, Magnus. Damn good job. Thank you, Mr. Brotherhood. Jack. From now on, it's Jack. Names, addresses, even a few deaf descriptions. Yes, I wasn't sure if they'd be useful. They'll enrich the file manner. This coffee's super, Jack. <laughs> Not what you're used to, eh? Um, one thing. A.H. Mean anything? Mm, no. Maybe A.H. Schmidt or something? All we have is A.H. And we thought we might find him among the Cosmocrowd, but he's not here. We think he's connected with somebody called Ollinger. Ollinger? I live with Ollingers. Good God. Hey. You don't mean Axel, do you? So I told you about Axel, Jack, in tones of respect and bemusement and hilarity. Did he detect the love there, too? He was picked up two weeks later, in the early hours before the cock had a chance to crow. At first I wondered why he'd done it. Axel's only crimes were his illegal presence, his poverty and his freedom of thought. That freedom, Jack, is what we're here to protect, at least in the eyes of some. But of course I understand now. You were still fairly junior. You had your way to make. A note to the Swiss, another to the Americans, no doubt. Your brownie points would climb. Within a month, I was on a train out of Bern for France, and from there to England. And somewhere close to Paris, I discovered tears on my cheeks and vowed never to be a spy again. Because, you see, Axel was the only friend I might ever have been able to tell everything to, and tell it gladly. Even now I might be able to tell him about arriving at the sad flat where my father had died, and the two ancient lovelies, what were their names? Lily, Rose. And they led me not into a bedroom to view the deceased, but into a bathroom. Axel may have smiled, been on the point of laughing, right up to the discovery of my father's body, rigid as ice, laid out in the bath. But at the final detail, Axel would not have laughed. He would have said, Ah, Sir Magnus, so killing him wasn't enough. All misfortune done away with, thing of the past. Providence turned up crackerjack. You have a library. And a billiard room. Like the house, then? It's amazing. Huh. It's your son. All in your name. You're 20, you're 50, you've got a home. Bought the place from the Duke of Devonshire. Crackerjack's the word. <laughs> that counts as here again, Governor. Thackeray? What's he want? Math like a clam. But he's got that brown leather bag with him. All right. I'll see you later, son. Yes. Dinner tonight's a feast. And then we're on the town. Welcome, Auntie. Park Lane, eh? It's amazing. You mentioned all these companies. Richard Pym Endeavour, Pym Mutual Property Trust, half a dozen more. Uh, he's a tycoon. And Mr Entertainment. Did he tell you he's got a scheme to have an entire Irish village give us their air? The wig market will boom with this new health service. Change days, Titch. Your dad's even a taxpayer now. <laughs> so you get up to Oxford and study the law like all our lives depend on it. Because they do. 
Magnus Richard Pym, at Oxford reading languages and literature. Dark blue blazer, cavalry twill trousers, brown shoes, virgin. College secretary of various clubs and societies, rugger, cricket and rowing. Passing terms, passing seasons, virginity retained. Stories told to various girls about dangerous clandestine adventures in Bern, no loss of virginity. Passing terms, passing seasons. Letter received from Jack Brotherhood, wishing Pym well with his studies and expressing interest in his future. A visit from an intermediary promised. A sheath knife bought, practice sessions throwing it at trees. Meeting with intermediary, Michael, no surname known. Provides basic and simplistic advice on espionage techniques, including use of dividers to spring locks. Attendance at several socialist clubs and debating societies. Names and opinions and descriptions of members delivered to Michael. Terms passing, seasons passing. Richard Thomas Pym, father of subject. Liberal candidate in Gulworth North. Son summoned to assist campaign. Votes gained, 6,404. Poor third, due in part to son's betrayal of father's secrets. Son's suspicion of father's suspicion. National Service call-up papers seen as beckoning sanctuary. Virginity intact. Who else did you phone on Monday night, Magnus? I wish you'd phone me now. I have news for you. Rather a lot of your agents have gone silent. In Prague, in Gdansk, in Warsaw. All unobtainable. Are they running? Hiding? Were they always your jaws and never really ours? When did all this start, best boy? Was it bad company in Bern? Was it when we had you mixed with the lefties at Oxford or when we sent you to Vienna? Sabina, the name you wanted removed from your record, was she the start? So who the hell is Sabina? Magnus Richard Pym, National Serviceman and Virgin. Report continues. Two months basic training, polishing boots and belt brasses and cap badges and being shouted at and sleeping soundly. Months passing, seasons passing, left, right, left, writing love letters on behalf of lonely, young, illiterate men. Majority attained, commission received, virginity retained. Second Lieutenant Pym. Transfer of the recommendation of certain men to a certain establishment for certain specialist training. Tramping and crawling and pointing guns and sleeping rough, mapless in the Scottish Highlands. Tracking strangers through the streets of Manchester while avoiding being tracked. Interview with commanding officer at the intelligence depot. Result? Transfer, in a continuing state of virginity, to Vienna, a divided city, British, American, Russian. Shown photographs of two men to be arrested on sight, Burgess and Maclean. And then, oh, then so long ago, I met and was dumbfounded and enthralled and delighted by Sabina. Ah, oh, all these camps, day after day after day. Why do we go to all these camps? To visit the refugees? Yes. To question, you come from Hungary and from Romania and sometimes Russia. What army did you see on the way here? <laughs> what vehicle are they in? What uniform are they in? You are desperate and homeless and maybe poor, but are you a spy? Would you like instead to spy for us? <laughs> have we ever found a spy? Magnus, have we made a spy? Not yet, Sabina. These roads are... Bendy and bumpy, is it? And I drive too fast? How did you learn to play this stupid game? Well, long story. Born to it, maybe. Some English families are. Yes. I watch you ask and I see you listen. I think you know about lies. Why do you let me translate into German? You speak German. How do you know that? People tell me things. Maybe you enjoy the words in my voice. But you have 
very little check and no sober bright. As you do, extremely useful. Saturdays I could give you lessons. Really? Well, that would be most useful. You are homosexual? Good Lord, no. <laughs> what made you ask that? You are English. With Englishmen it's uncertain. Well, I am certain. Then maybe after the lesson we make love. It didn't happen, Jack. There were no language lessons, because when she opened her door to me the following Saturday, she was naked. Some time later, to use the discreet form, I said to her, I didn't know. What I meant was that for all my longing, I'd never known what I was longing for. I meant that I was made whole, and I'd joined the men at last. A week later, but can this be true? I'm sure of what she told me, every word. But were those words really spoken in a moonlit orchard where an intelligence officer and his lover lay naked on a black watch tartan shawl? Underneath the apples, moonshine in our eyes. What I tell you, Magnus, I tell no one else this side of frontier. Mm. In Prague I have a brother, his name is Jan. I look forward to meeting all your family. Oh, your breasts in moonlight. Oh. Jan will trust you because of me and because of what I've told him about you. All good. I'm flattered. I am in heaven. My brother has a friend who wishes to come out. The friend is brilliant. Mm -hmm. Top access. He can bring you many secrets. All I care about are your secrets. Listen, Magnus. The British will not allow me, interpreter, working with your spies, to have contact with close family in a communist country. Mm. So, you must invent a story for your people about how you get this information. Don't worry. As you said, my darling, I know about lies. Weiser's Ross. Never heard of it. It's a pub, sir. A bit shabby, but lots of Czech emigres drink there. As do you. I look in fairly often. One never knows. One never does. And you've picked up on something? Well, yes, but it's a bit, well, a wee bit more dramatic than picking up. Do tell. I'd been there only a few minutes last night when the barman said there was a phone call for me. Uh, a man's voice, middle-aged, accented German, polite. He gave me directions which he claims will lead us to some good stuff. Not another Hungarian frontier guard, I hope. We've rather had our fill of them. No, sir. Czech. Attached to HQ Southern Command, based outside Prague. Czech? Well, no. Promising. Most of our Czech info comes from the Americans. They're for corrupt. And where will these directions take you? To a barn, sir, near the crossroads to Klein Brandorf. A barn? Yes, sir. I'm to find a white painted stone not far from the crossroads, and the barn should be nearby, beside a lake. I'm to go in plain clothes, no uniform. Hello? Hello, indeed. Come in. Close the door. Let us have some light. There. Now come towards me, Sir Magnus. Slowly, of course. Axel? I know what you're thinking. Why a table and two chairs in the barn? Just like one of your reception rooms where you interrogate refugees. Interview, not... Good God! Axel! I'm so glad you accepted my invitation. After what? Nearly five years? You no doubt have a 38 British service revolver about your person. This one is Russian made, so while I attempt to hold mine steady, you take your gun out. Slowly, of course. Let's avoid accidents or heroics. Neither of us is a member of the shooting classes. Good. Now, lay it down on the table. I've never fired a gun in anger in my life, Jack. I know you have. And now with the embassy burn box pressing against my leg like a faithful or a, a frightened dog. I remember you had to shoot your Labrador bitch, buried her, sat by a grave and drank a half bottle of scotch. 
All I've ever shot at is training targets and clay pigeons. When those two old lovelies, all twenty fingers bony and tight on my arms, led me through to view my dead father, I did feel a chill in my spine and a stirring in my guts as if I were being led to face a firing squad. But instead they took me into a bathroom. Funerals, Magnus, love, they cost money. And there ain't a penny in the house, darling. See, he was having his liquidity again. Any idea the cost of a coffin? He was lying in the bath, feet marbled and crossed, hands cupped on his white belly. He was half submerged in glistening ovals and cubes and triangles and mush, all glistening. Ice. He was wearing a shroud of ice. In A Perfect Spy by John le Carre, dramatised for radio by Robert Forrest, Magnus was played by Julian Ryan Tutt, Jack by Bill Patterson, Axel, Anton Lesser, Rick, Michael Maloney, Peggy Wentworth, Aoife McMahon, Sid Lemon, Ewan Bailey, Kate, Tracy Wiles, Tom, Adam Thomas Wright, Sabina, Sancia McCormack, and Nigel by Gerard McDermott. Other parts were played by the cast. A Perfect Spy was a BBC Scotland production directed by Bruce Young. <laughs>